Um, but basically, this is the audience report section. This is your overview page. You have a lot of different information you can view here. And then when you go under, you have demographics. It's going to allow you to see your age and genders uh, of people visiting your site. You also have the ability to pull up affinity channels and see interests um, if you have this turned on. This is a function you have to turn on. And then this is my favorite part. You can actually dive in and see where traffic's coming from. So you see a lot of our traffic here is coming from California. We dive in here, and then you can see the section. It's all kind of grouped together, so you can zoom in. And then see that a bunch of come from Mountain View, Sunnyville, Santa Clara, San Jose, and these different areas. We also can dive in and see what people are using when they come to our site. So for example, these are the different browsers they're using. So you see Chrome, Safari, um, Android, and then we can also go and see how many are using mobile devices. So here you can see the desktop, mobile, and tablet traffic and all the data for that. You can also switch it over and do a pie graph if you want to see it visualized that way. Uh, you can also dive in and see devices. So this is what you can also see uh, are they using an Apple iPhone, Apple iPad, and so forth. So this is like a great way to really understand what are your users doing when they come to your site. Uh, I also use this to troubleshoot. Uh, if you're trying, if you're having a lot of errors come through, you can kind of go through and see what are people, most people using with your website. It's also a great way to see, um, if you notice when we were back there, a lot of visitors coming to the site are on mobile devices. Um, this is a great way to see how much of your traffic is coming through a certain device so that you can then go test and see how your site looks on that device. Go see, uh, in, in this case, Apple iPhone. Go, go pull it up, your site up on an Apple iPhone, or if you don't have one, borrow, borrow someone's and just take a look and make sure your site looks right. Um, this is a good way to make sure that you're presenting to the most customers the right view or the right look for your website. Acquisition reports uh, is the second section. Inside of here, uh, this is where you're going to find out what's driving your traffic, where they're coming from. Uh, it's going to help you understand your conversions and what your marketing, what marketing channels are working. So here you can find information about each channel. So like your ad channel, AdWords channel, SEO, social, and then UTMs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We can actually see where everybody's coming from and what they're doing and what channels are working. So same thing here. This is your acquisition overview page. You can see the different channels. We have organic search, social, direct, referral, and we can see what the traffic is doing. And then we're able to actually dive in in more depth. So when you go into here, you have your channels, and we're able to see a lot more data, including conversions over in the right column. We can visualize it by changing the look to a pie graph and see where does most of our stuff come from. In this case, organic search is generating the most. We can also see our source of mediums. Uh, so this report is going to show us you know, we have YouTube referrals, we have um, from analytics, there's some referrals. This is actually Google's store. Uh, this is a demo account of Google's store, so you can see where Google's actually getting all their traffic from um, for their store. These are different referrals. These are where, what sites people came from. So you can actually see what sites are sending traffic to your website. You can pull up AdWords if you're running an AdWords <laughs> campaign and you've linked it together. Here you're seeing you're able to pick which account you have, and then you can actually go over Second. I thought I did that. Maybe I did. You're able to pull up the different ad groups and the different campaigns. So this is where you can actually see if those campaigns and how they're interacting. While you can see this information on AdWords, sometimes seeing this information inside of Google Analytics is going to majorly help out with understanding how uh, your AdWords is performing. We can even dive in and see what AdWord keywords are working for us. So in this case, Google uh, Plus Merchandise. Um, well, none of these are generic. This Google's not running any AdWords on this, but you'll be able to see which keywords are working. You can even look at your video campaigns if you're running video campaigns on YouTube for your site. Search Console, this also integrates with Search Console. Um, and one of the SEO talks you've probably heard about using this called Google Webmaster Tools. Uh, sometimes it's um, now called Google Search Console. You can link Google Search Console and pull that data straight into your <laughs> analytics. Allows you to see what Google's doing with your site. You can also see uh, a social report, so we can see here what's going on, uh, what social networks are sending traffic to our site, where they're coming from. Uh, this shows all the different networks. You can see page views, sessions, how many pages per sessions from those different channels, and understand that a little bit, uh, a little bit better, so you can focus in on the social media. This is 
uh, what we're going to focus in on in a little bit for your TMs. These are your custom campaigns. So in here, we can actually look at all of our campaigns uh, when we're doing UTM codes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And you can uh, uh, dive in and look at your source, your mediums, and so forth, which is kind of what we're showing through here. So with all this data, uh, I'm going to take questions at the end so we can get through everything, and then we'll come back. Um, with all this data, uh, filters um, and advanced segments is a, is a great way for us to really dive into this data and understand this data a little bit closer. Um, the difference is uh, filters allows us to basically filter out the traffic coming into our whole entire Google Analytics profile. So this is permanent. It stops it from ever being reported um, or modifies that data as being reported all the time. Advanced segment is where we're able to actually apply it to the data that's already in the account. Uh, so we can actually isolate visitor groups and we can pull up by uh, installing segments. We can actually put different segments on and see, for example, only mobile or only desktop and filter the account by that way. Uh, and I'm going to kind of show you how you would set this up and then what you would use those for as an example. So when you go into analytics, you're going to go over to admin. They actually, since I took the screenshot, they've switched it. It's going to actually now be on the left side, down at the bottom. You'll find admin. And then the rest of it is still the same. You'll go over to your view, and you'll hit filters. Add filter. And then you can go ahead and put in what parameters you want that filter to be. Uh, for example, this is blocking an internal IP address. You can even create custom filters. So this is where you can actually filter by different pieces. They have pre-built ones like the IP block, and then you can also create your own custom filters. Uh, one of the things that, uh, for filtering, why would you filter? One of the things you may want to filter out is you may want to filter out all uh, internal traffic. You're going to be a, when you visit your website, you're not going to be your typical user. You're going to do things because you're testing your website. You're going to visit more pages than a typical user will. You do not want that data corrupting everything you do. So what you're going to want to do is pull your own IP address, which you can go to whatismyip.com, or you just go to Google and just search what is my IP address, and Google will actually tell you what's your IP address. You can plug that IP address in here and block it from ever being reported in analytics. This way, you're not tracking yourself when you go to your site. Um, if you have development sites or staging uh, environments, you're going to want to exclude those as well. Because again, that's the same thing we just talked about. You're not going to be your typical traffic, uh, following typical traffic patterns that other people are following. So uh, if you have like a .dev or a .local or um, you know, if you're using a staging environment on your host, you want to go ahead and block that as well from analytics. So only your live site's recording, but you can still keep analytics installed. I've seen some people go onto their um, dev sites and disable analytics. You don't want to do that. You want to actually exclude it from analytics so the code's still firing. One of the things I actually suggest is to create different views. And so you can create one view that you exclude your uh, staging environment, and then you can create another view where you only include your staging environment. Because then that way you're able to track and see if events or different pieces are tracking on the staging side before you push it to your live side. Uh, lower casing uh, campaign attributes. Um, so whenever you have like a UTM or any kind of campaign that's coming over into your site, it will track. It's case sensitive. So if you have a, a marketing team and somebody advertises and they put a spring sale with uh, capital letters, and you have another one who does uppercase and lowercase letters, and you have someone who does all lowercase, all three of those will track separate even though they're the same parameter. So one of the things that you can do is you can use um, a filter to actually take all that data when it comes in make all of it lowercase, and then put it all into analytics as lowercase. So it will actually combine all that data together because it will notice that they're all lowercase. Um, so this is uh, another example. And I know it's kind of hard to read there. Um, I have these slides available. I'll show you the link at the end. Uh, you can go download these and uh, view them on your own and see them a little bit closer up. You can also exclude uh, query parameters. Um, so I'm sure you guys have seen, uh, if you're using like a shopping cart or something like that, and you uh, make an order, you might have like website.com slash order, uh, and then a question mark, and then ID equals whatever that order number is. 
analytics will naturally track each one of those as something separate. Well, you might not want to track each one of those IDs to a separate page. You might want to track it all just to order. So you can create a filter that removes that query string so that everything will just be tracked to order.php in this example here. Other filter examples you can do, um, you can also make a filter that includes or excludes a specific campaign. Uh, you can do a lowercase on your uh, URL. You can also attach a host name to it. So for example, if you're tracking a subdomain and a uh, regular domain with analytics, it's all going to track just, analytics actually only tracks after the slash. Uh, uh, um, so for example, example.com slash page dot HTML would only be tracked as page dot HTML. So instead, if you want to track it inside the analytics as domain.com slash page uh, dot HTML, you can create a filter that will modify the data to do that. You can also uh, create a mobile only view with a filter or uh, also include or exclude traffic to a specific directly, directory, so like slash blog, slash shop. So if you wanted to create a special view to just show just your blog traffic, you could include just blog and exclude everything else. And then advanced segments, these work very similar to filters, except they're not going to be permanent. You will, the data will all still come into your account, and then you can actually view by that. And I'll show you how we do that. First, we set up an advanced segment. So we come in here, and when you add these segments in, you'll see right here we have all users, and then we have organic traffic. So this is a advanced segment, and you'll see, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have a third one, just referral traffic. So the referral traffic's in green. We can actually visualize all the data and compare them. So we can see all users, how many organic, and how many referral, all on one screen. Uh, so this is why I actually prefer advanced segments over filters. Filters are great when you're looking at blocking IP addresses, um, but when you want to just filter your regular data, Advanced segments is the easiest way to visualize what's going on with different things. So setting these up is actually pretty simple. Whenever you go to any report inside of analytics, you'll always see at the top, it'll have all users, and then you'll see an add segment. When you click on add segment, it'll open up this box here, and you can actually pick from any of these segments that are already in here, or you can hit new segment. And then what you want to do is put in your segment name, and yeah, so you put in your segment name and you can save your segment. Um, or you can go down over to conditions and create what the conditions are. So I like to go into conditions um, and set my own parameters in. And you can also set up sequences. So sequences is something that's kind of new. You can actually say, I want to only see what people who came to my homepage and then went to my pricing page, I want to see what those people did. Um, if they went to my home page and they went to my blog, I can care less what they did. But if they came to the home page and then went to my pricing page, I want to see what that traffic did. You can create a sequence and then you can actually filter by that sequence. So with advanced segments, you can use it for everything that filters are used for. Uh, one of the biggest things I use it for is uh, detecting, uh, comparing mobile traffic to desktop traffic and also to tablet traffic. You can also show traffic from a specific campaign um, or maybe from a certain location. So maybe you wanted to show only the people that came to your site from Florida versus the people who came to your site from California. Uh, you can also include or exclude traffic to like your subdomains again, like blog and shop. Um, this is this is the way I prefer to do it. I don't actually create filters to put my blog into a separate view. I actually just have an advanced segment that goes up that shows my blog traffic separate from traffic that is that was not to slash blog, um, just so I can see what, how many people are coming to my actual business site versus how many people are just coming and reading our articles. The other really cool thing about advanced segments is there is a gallery, so if you don't want to create your own, uh, there is a gallery that has all of these in it on Google. And I don't actually link to it here. Um, um, I'm trying to remember. If you search for um, Google Analytics um, segment or advanced segment gallery, you'll find this uh, gallery, or when you're inside creating one, there's a link to it inside of there that will tell you click here to view the gallery. 
And you can add any of these into your analytics account. These are ones that were created by other people. Or if you create one you really like and you want to upload for other people to use, you can. It will not take your data. It will just upload the parameters that people can apply to their data. So then with analytics, um, one of the biggest things I want to track, uh, talk about is event tracking. Uh, event tracking is located under your behavior section. Um, what events are is these are interactions that can be tracked independently or whenever a screen loads. Um, these, are, these are different than goal tracking, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, event tracking are just tracking different events. So for example, on uh, one of our sites that we manage, it's a uh, hospital, we actually track every time someone clicks on a button to request an appointment, and then we also track when they actually submit the request. So we can see how many people were interested in originally requesting it by clicking the call to action button, and then we're able to actually pull up the event that shows that they actually submitted that form to see how many people got to the form and you know, gave up or freaked out over you know, whatever happened with that form. Uh, you can track all kinds of different things, ad clicks, downloads, um, gadgets, flash elements, Ajax embedded elements, whatever you really want. Uh, another thing people do with event tracking is they actually track with YouTube. They'll track if they have a YouTube video on their page. They'll track all the people who play the video. So you can see, is that video, is anyone watching that video that I have on my homepage that's slowing my whole site down, or is everybody ignoring it? Um, I had a client whose site was a little slow because they had a whole bunch of YouTube videos on there. We put event tracking on, and came to find out nobody was watching those videos. And uh, there was only a few to watch these videos, and the ones that were watching these videos, none of them were converting. Uh, the people who were converting were people who weren't paying attention to his videos. So we just took the videos off, and it never changed his amount of conversion skills get. Conversion rate was fine. His website was much faster, which then helped out with SEO and other factors as well. So with event tracking, uh, you'll see it does pop up inside here. Um, this is on a UTM uh, item that shows, you can see the event action of people who copied it, people who added a new UTM link in there, and people who saved the link. And we can see the different amounts of people that did each one of those. And then we can also, and we filter those out, um, basically we're showing them two different ways here. You can actually add a value to an event, so if the event is worth something to you, you can add a value to it, um, or just track how many times people are doing it. You can also, again, create advanced segments off of these. So you can go back and actually say, I want to see all the traffic that clicked this button, and you can create an advanced segment based off of that event. Implementing these, um, depending on what plugin you're using, some of the plugins actually have the ability to track events automatically for you. If not, um, you can actually set up manually by adding this stuff into your link on an on-click element. Uh, so this is some JavaScript that you can add in. This is an example of what it would look like. Uh, you can actually go to Google's site, and they'll actually give you all the information of how you can implement this JavaScript code uh, if you need to. And then um, you can also, with event tracking, you can also fire these to Google Tag Manager as well if you use a Google Tag Manager um, to, to fire these events. So goal tracking. The goal is, when I, when I talk about events, events are, you can track as many events as you want. With goals, you can only track 20 goals on Google Analytics. So you want to be a little bit more uh, picky of what you're going to actually consider a goal. And the way I look at it as an event is, 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 is exactly that. It's something that happened, so we're going to track every event that we may ever be interested in seeing. But a goal is what we ultimately want someone to do on our site. If you have a newsletter sign up on your site, that might be your goal. That might be a goal is how many people, I want to get people to sign up for my newsletter. So the goal would be how many people actually signed up for that newsletter. Or if you have a contact form, your goal is going to be how many people filled out that contact form um, and, and, and submitted their, their information to me. That's going to be a goal. Uh, you can do it for even making a purchase. Uh, if it's a mobile gaming app, you can even do something like putting a, a certain level of, uh, in the game. Submitting contact information for marketing lead generation site, all those different pieces are ways you can, you can use goals. Setting up goal tracking. Um, there's different ways. Uh, you have URL destination goals. So these track visits to a specific URL. So if you have like a thank you page or something like that, you can actually track that as a goal when I hit that page. You can do visit duration goals. So this is like, uh, this is good if you have a blog site and you're trying to see how long people say because uh, you know that your articles 
would on average take three minutes to read, and so you're looking for an actively engaged user. You can set a three minute you know, goal of people who stayed on my site for longer than three minutes. Uh, pages per, per visit. Uh, if you're trying to, if you're, uh, we, we have uh, somebody who has a appliance store and they have you shop through their website. Their ultimate goal is they want to see how many people are actually shopping. And the way we're able to figure that out is by setting up a pages per visit goal and say, if they're visiting multiple pages, they're actively shopping your site versus if they're just landing on one page and leaving, then they're not shopping. Uh, so we have a page, uh, page visits. Um, I think that one we say if they go through at least three pages, they've started doing, they've, they've accomplished that goal. And then you have event-based goals. So this is going back to those events we set up. We can actually track those items as an event and then pull them over and say, if that event happens, the goal is completed. So when we're talking about, for example, tracking um, the sign-up forms for the hospital, we don't, when they click the button, they didn't really complete our, they didn't complete our goal. They just started the process. <laughs> so we track that as an event, but then the second event that we track when they click um, submit, that actually means they submitted their information, which is what our ultimate goal was. So then we track that event as a goal. You want to know the most important metrics? So um, we're looking at, again, leads, trial signups, account creations, um, so if you have like a, a, a member of services, when someone signs up to become a, a member of your site, that, that would be a goal. Uh, white paper downloads, ebook downloads, or any kind of downloads you may have on your site, those could be goals as well. So with a destination-based goal, it's really hard to see, but it's really simple. You fill out this form, um, and over here on the right, you can actually put in or you put in inside this section, you put in what the goal URL is. This side is the event-based goal. So in this one, you actually can select what category, action, and label that event would have that would end up firing that goal. And then, just like with events, you can actually sign a goal value. Um, so this is what that goal is uh, worth to you. Uh, so some people actually assign an arbitrary value. Uh, they say, you know, they are, they, they're tracking inside their system, they know how much a lead is actually worth to them. So they may say, every lead I get is worth about $100. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, each time this converts, I'd like Google to, to, to think I made $100 off of this goal being accomplished. This actually allows you in other reports to, to look and see how much each channel generated for you in revenue or potential revenue. Uh, you can also do e-commerce tracking, which is a whole separate section. Uh, so don't get that confused with uh, this traditional goal tracking. E-commerce is a, a whole separate section you can set up and implement with your shopping cart. It literally tracks the co uh, price of every single item you sold. Uh, and you would use that when you're trying to track uh, actual value of selling products. So then we get down to our conversion rate. Um, the reason we like to use goals is we're able to then see conversion rate on items. We're able to say that, you know, in this case, from, from Google, we have a 33% conversion rate um, on goal six, and goal seven has a 51% conversion rate. Being Yahoo, AOL, which I don't even know why it's in there, but <laughs> someone might use it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we can see the goal conversion rates on those and see how many of those people are actually converting when they come over. Um, this, is, this is actually a very great way to see which marketing channels are more valuable. If you're using, for example, Facebook, Twitter, um, and you're putting an equal amount of time into them, but you're seeing it on Facebook, you get a lot more conversions from there. Maybe you want to put a little bit of extra time into Facebook and focus on that. Um, custom dashboards. This is this is a section um, I I thought about removing, but I decided to leave it in here for now. Um, was anyone in here for Mike's talk yesterday on Data Studio, Google Data Studio? Um, so Google Data Studio is a new system where you can actually connect into analytics and you can create custom dashboards. Google, for the longest time, had the ability inside of analytics to create these pre-built dashboards, uh, which were great for tracking things. But now they have Data Studio. Data Studio does a much better job. It's a little more involved in setting up. Uh, and, and on their dashboard section, they're now heavily promoting Data Studio. So that leads me to believe that this piece that we're going to talk about may not stay inside of Google Analytics much longer. I have a feeling they're going to announce the end of life on this uh, part of the product probably in the next year or two. 
But I will tell you about it. If you do want to use these over uh, Data Studio, they are very easy to set up. Uh, they're basically a collection of widgets that you can then set up um, inside by just accessing dashboards. And you can create all these different dashboards. Uh, so you can create both versions one, different SEO ones, social media, visitor facts, um, e-commerce, mobile. You can create all these different dashboards um, that are going to help you to see the data that's going on on your site. You uh, Again, you go to the Google, uh, in there, there's the URL, google.com slash analytics slash gallery. Inside that gallery, they have pre-built dashboards you can pull and load into your site as well. Uh, so this might be a faster way than using Data Studio if you're just trying to get a quick dashboard up and running. Just remember, this, this might not be around forever inside of analytics. It might still be. They may decide never to discontinue it. But I, I just think when they're promoting as heavily as they are, they're, they're, they're thinking about getting rid of it. <laughs> and then this is, out of the whole, out of the whole talk, the biggest thing um, I like to push is UTMs. Um, a UTM is basically a, well, all right, look at this slide here. A uh, UTM is basically, as a tracking module. It allows you to append a group of tags in the URL. And I'm sure you've seen these URLs that have all these things in them before. This allows us to custom track URLs. So when you post something on Facebook, we can see that the traffic came from Facebook, but that's all you can see. With UTMs, we're able to actually put in the source of being Facebook, and then we can say the medium was a Facebook post, and then the campaign was a certain campaign that you're running that you can give a unique name to. This allows us to go down to the point that we can even use content and term to identify exactly what post was made, and this allows us really to dive into that data and understand what post actually drove that traffic and converted it. You can then go back and see what did I write in that post and what made that post work. Uh, you can use these links on social media. You can use these links if you're putting it on someone else's website. Um, I know uh, Josh, for example, he, he's, he's tracked a few things you know, with his stuff where he's seeing where people from different portions of his site are coming into his other site. Uh, there's a lot of different pieces that you can track with uh, UTMs and, and really understand your traffic, where it's coming from. Can I give you a quick example? You have this long URL here, and all we're doing is we're breaking this down into each section. So for example, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm praying you guys way. Um, so you have the URL, which is the first part, and then what we do is we have our campaign source, our campaign medium, and our campaign name. And then we also have, oh, I lost those lines, your campaign content and your uh, campaign term. And what these mean is basically you have your campaign source. So this is going to be the main referral. So did it come from Google? Did it come from Facebook, Twitter? Um, was it maybe a MailChimp campaign you sent out? This is going to be our ultimate source of where that traffic came from. Uh, and this is usually just the website or whatever system sent the uh, traffic. And then your medium is going to be what that marketing type is. So was it a, uh, a, a paid ad or a banner ad? Was it an email that you sent? Was it a post, a tweet? Um, maybe it was an article link. Uh, you could put those inside of the medium. And then we have campaign. This you can call whatever you want. Uh, so this is whatever you name your campaign. Hopefully you're tracking this campaign into a spreadsheet or Maybe it's part of a bigger campaign, but you can go ahead and track this spring sale. And the reason that you have the campaign name and you don't just track the campaign name, you track the other pieces, is you can be running a spring sale on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and so you're tracking those three different ones as your sources, and you can be doing a Facebook ad versus a Facebook page post versus a, uh, um, you know, a personal post on Facebook. So your source would be Facebook, and then your medium would be defined as you know, a page, a post, or an ad. And then we have the ability to do content. So this is a uh, great for A-B testing ads. Uh, when you're, you do content A and content B, so we can see which one of those perform better. So let's say you have two really great ideas for copy, but you're not sure which one's going to be better. Post one and then post the other. 
and then just add this in here, and then you can go back in and track later and see where uh, people are going. And then if you're doing uh, paid ads somewhere else besides Google, you can actually set up UTM term and use put your keyword in there. Um, this is, for example, like doing Bing ads or something like that, where it doesn't automatically integrate with Google Analytics. You can still track those keywords. Uh, AdWords will automatically track all of this for you. So um, the AdWords section we're talking about inside acquisition. So you don't need to use UTMs and AdWords if you don't want to. And then to find this information, we go back to the acquisition section. We go to campaigns. And then we, you see where those sections that we zoomed in on earlier, they're really hard to see here. You can actually pull up the different campaign sources, medium, and so forth, and see them all inside there. When you pull up one of those, you'll be able to see all the campaign names. And we can see the sessions. And you see over here on the conversion side, we can actually see our conversions. So we can go back, and this is where we're talking about having goal conversions set up. We can really dive in now and see each of these individualized campaigns. We can see which ones are completing our goals, which is ultimately what you want. It's not just traffic you want, but you want people converting. So we can actually go back in and see that conversion rate and see how well each of those are doing, uh, each of those campaigns are doing. And we can actually filter it down by source, medium. And again, going back to the advanced segments, we can create advanced segments based off of these UTMs as well and see only traffic that came through from uh, this specific Facebook post, for example. So creating UTMs is actually a lot easier than you think it is. You don't have to write all that crazy uh, uh, code out behind the uh, uh, link. You can Google, do a Google search for a UTM builder, a whole bunch. Um, we actually built one that's free to use on our site, uh, datadrivenlabs.io slash UTM. Um, and just kind of show you how that works. This is how easy it is. You go to one of these UTM builders, and you go in, add your URL. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and just add example.com. Come over here, you add your source. Um, and this particular builder, we actually explained to you what the source can be over on the side, so you can see uh, some examples. Uh, so in this case, we're going to do Facebook. We're going to do a CPC because it's a pay to add. And then our campaign name, we're going to call the Spring Sale. And then we're going to come down to the bottom and click copy the URL, or copy a URL to clipboard. And now it's copied, and we go press Control V um, or Command V on any other page and uh, or anywhere else, and that URL is going to come over. And you see, it did generate that whole URL. It's a little really small, but it's all there, uh, and you can just use that now to put into, say, your Facebook post or any of your other items. Um, and it's really simple. That's how those work. Um, the one thing that a lot of people complain about, the, they don't look pretty, they're really long. Um, you can use a shortener service, Bitly is a great one. Um, I used to recommend uh, Google's shortener service, but if you are using Google's shortener service, they are uh, disabling that in two months. So you're going to need to go ahead and move all your URLs to a different shortener if you're using Google's. Bitly is still up and running, so you can use Bitly. Uh, it basically makes that really small, tiny link. Uh, that is a lot, looks a lot nicer when you're putting it into like a tweet or anything like that. All right, I'm sure there's some questions, and so I would like to go ahead and take them. And I want to, was there, there was a question going in the presentation over here in the back? I'm not sure if I answered it already. All right, yes, ma'am. So the filters, if you put on a filter, is that going into your advanced segments, or are they different? In the uh, that segment, do you get the whole data into that, or? No, if you create a filter, the filter is going to stop the data from ever coming in. Okay. Um, so like, if you think about it like as a building, right? Uh, your filter could be the security guard in the front, and he's just going to turn certain people away and not even let them come into the building. Uh, versus an advanced segment, everyone's already in the building, and now you're saying, everybody who's wearing a green shirt stand over there, and everybody who's wearing a red shirt stand over here, they're already in the building, versus if you told the security guard up front, don't let anybody in the building with a green shirt, you never will be able to go back in and filter the green shirt because they're not ever there. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. When um, you use Google Data Studio, you bring data in from other sources in addition to the analytics. Correct. So you can blend in the data on your, your machine itself. Ish. Um, 
Yeah, so you can pull Google. You have, to have something to do. Yeah, so you can, pull, you can pull other data sources with Google Data Studio in. Um, you can, on, on, on the actual page, you can make maybe a chart here is from Google Analytics, a chart here is from Facebook. You can't take it and say, I want to add data from Facebook and Google Analytics together and make one number. But you can put it on the same, so you can have a dashboard that's intermixed with Google Analytics, Facebook, Twitter, um, and all the different data sources. So when you share that data, then you can share that with somebody outside of your website. They remember that you go inside the back end of your website. Correct. There is a way you can set up a um, you can set up a uh, a view that is a public view that people can come in and view that data. Confused, you talk when you were talking about filters. You mentioned that you could create uh, sequences to follow what uh, uh, somebody does, and that they do talk about events. And you can also see the person clicking here and then ended up doing the contact. What is the difference? Between those so, events uh, what, what you do with events is you can, I set up my events in a sequence. But the events are all individual events. Um, you can then go into the advanced segments and say, I want to create a sequence that they complete that they go from event one, event two, event three, and I want to see all people who went through all three levels. I want to see what they did after that. And so you can create that advanced segment based off of that sequence. But the events themselves, I like to track all of the events through the sequence, but events do not track an actual funnel. Um, for tracking funnels, there's products out there. Google Analytics has it for goal tracking. It's not really well done. There's a product called Mixed Panel. Um, not Mixed Panel, I'm sorry. Um, Mixed Panel will do it too. Um, there's a product called Hotjar that works really great for tracking funnels if you want to track funnels. And Hotjar has a free version and there's a low price version. And you can actually track an, uh, an exact conversion funnel if you want to do that. Uh, Google Analytics is horrible with conversion funnels. Um, they have one for goals, it just does not uh, work very well. <laughs> uh, the last one you said, what was it, hot one? Oh, a uh, hot jar, H O T J A R dot com. Do you recommend um, uploading your own search console or a separate search console or using Google Analytics properties? Um, what do you mean uploading? Use Monster or insert code, right? Which one do you prefer? Oh, okay. Uh, me personally, I prefer Google Tag Manager, um, which is a whole different system. But I always like putting the code on the site um, because I like to have a little bit more control. Um, Monster Insights is a plugin that's ran by, um, he actually lives not too far from here. I'm surprised he didn't come. Uh, Chris Kristoff manages that project, it's owned by Dead Pink Beginner. Um, and uh, it is a product. And so any time they can change the functionality of what that product can do. And so for me, I prefer to just put the code myself on the page. But if you're a beginner or you're not sure how to put the code on the page, using the plugin method is what I suggest because if you don't put the code right on your page, then you might not be tracking. And if it stops working or it's not working correctly, you might be losing some data. So as long as you know what you're doing, put the code on your page. If you're not sure, use a plugin to help you with it. Does that help with your? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, for handling multiple clients that you're going to be uh, installing Google Analytics on, on all other sites, what um, what is the best method, I guess, for I guess easily managing all of them? Do you have one account that you put them all through and then add them all as properties, or do you have separate you know, Gmail email so addresses you set up? He's asking if you have multiple accounts. Um, that you're managing. With this, there's a whole entire user level. You can add people on as administrative users or as just managers. Um, there's four different user level brackets you can add people in. I suggest each one, each each client is separate, be in its own account. And then if they, if they own multiple websites, then each of those websites be in a property. You can only have uh, 50 property, no, you only have 100 properties per account though. So like, for example, I have the hospital network I work with, uh, we own 300 websites. Um, and I track all 300 of those websites. So with them, we have uh, account one, account two, and account three, and we actually have a fourth account. And then we have a bunch of properties for each one of those um, 
hospitals and doctor's offices shoved under as a property. Now, I will not take company A and company B, then they're not associated with each other, and put them under the same account as each of properties, because then if one of them leaves you, they are now inside of an account with somebody else that's not them. So make each, each organization its own account, and then each website its own property within that organization. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I always encourage the, uh, encourage the uh, client to sign up for the account, um, and then add you on as an administrator, or you create the account and then add them on as an administrator and put it into their account. Um, just because it's very frustrating for them later on when they go to and they, they, they let's say they're not using you anymore and then a year later they go to hire somebody else and they're like, well, I don't know who had my account and then you're later on having to deal with getting the account transferred over to them when they have been your customer for a year. So always let them so that they technically own the account but you have access to manage it. All right, any other questions? Awesome. All right. You mentioned early on there was another website where the training video was posted.